can you see me now? Yes. Uh, well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's our great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Nick Prawn with us. He's uh, a senior research staff uh, at IPM Research, specialized in, in, in uh, quantum hardware. He will talk uh, to us today about uh, superconducting uh, Cupid architecture and the the main the main physics of of quantum hardware and uh, and. Uh, what does it mean to have like something called like a uh, circuit dot Hadamard or C naught and and everything to understand uh, what is actually happening uh, to the quantum system itself? So uh, I think that uh, Professor Ahmed Yunus would like to say a few words to you and to the audience, and then uh, the mic is all yours. Uh, Thanks. Can you? I, yeah. Again, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Nick Prawn for uh, accepting to being with us today. Uh, uh, this is really pleasure and honor to the group. Uh, and we are um, interested in IBM quantum computer uh, very much in the group. So uh, I think uh, uh, we will expecting many questions uh, by the end of the talk. Uh, so please take this opportunity to ask Do Dr. Nick uh, during uh, uh, his, his really interesting and wonderful talk. Thank you, Doctor. Hey, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, and and uh, I really appreciate all of your questions. And it's an honor to be here, at, even though virtually at, at Alexandria University. Um, let me just first ask that you can see my uh, presentation, correct? Yeah, yeah, yes, very good. We, we can see okay. it. Yeah. Great. Then everything is working. Okay. So I'm going to start with a story. About 40 years ago, uh, there was a conference that was co-hosted by IBM and MIT on. The, uh, it was the first physics of computation conference uh, co-hosted. It was at MIT and it had some of the luminaries in quantum computing that uh, uh, that kind of pioneered the field back in, in 1981, uh, such as Richard Feynman, who's back here uh, in the right. Uh, and and many of you may know that Richard Feynman proposed uh, used having a, a computer that obeyed the laws of quantum mechanics so he could easily solve quantum mechanical problems such as simulating molecules and nuclei for example but there's another idea that was that was around and that was kind of pioneered by ibm researchers such as ralph landauer here in the uh, front uh, middle-ish section and charlie bennett who was actually taking the picture uh, and they were thinking about um you know uh when when um when when people came up with a the theory of computation there was a lot of power to be gained by abstracting the computation away from what uh, the physics or mechanism of the computer itself. Um, but what Ralph Landauer and Charlie Bennett were considering was, well, you can't actually separate the physics of the uh, device from the physics of the information because they were interested in studying the thermodynamics of information. And one of the things that um, uh, caused them to get into quantum computing was the notion that uh, quantum processes are irreversible. So, or I'm sorry, quantum processes are irreversible, which means there is no change in entropy, there is no change in energy in those systems. So they were kind of playing with it from a different angle. So what do I mean when I say uh, you want to, uh, you want to, um, you know, marry back the the physics uh, of the devices that you're studying in. And, and I like to uh, bring up examples, and I usually will come back to classical uh, mechanics to, or classical computing to, to illustrate these examples. So you can think of a classical bit as something that is like an on or off of a light switch, or whether current is flowing or not flowing in a transistor, or the polarity of little magnets, uh, little tiny magnets in your hard disk drive. And those encode the states zero and one. And because they're uh, nonlinear systems, they're kind of latching to one degree or another. Uh, they can only represent those zero and one states, and kind of like nothing in between. However, if you uh, want to, if you want to uh, encode uh, information in a quantum system, you can say take the ground or an excited state of an atom, or the up and down spin of an electron, or what we use, which are oscillations uh, in tiny superconducting circuits, and you can encode those systems as zero and one, but then those states that you represent zero and one, they obey the Schrodinger equation. And without needing to know much about it, Schrodinger is a linear equation, which means any uh, solution of that equation, you can take a superposition, meaning you can take some part zero, some part one, and that is also a solution of the Schrodinger equation. And that's a fundamental thing you get out of quantum mechanics is the ability uh, uh, to have superposition. So. Uh, we typically represent these states on something called the block sphere, where the north pole is a zero and the south pole is a one. And then any surface on this sphere, I think of it like the Earth, is going to be a linear superposition of zero and one. In particular, the equator is going to be an equal superposition. And these superpositions are related to the fact that when you measure 
the quantum system, you get a probabilistic outcome. So on the equator, if you measure an, an, a state along the equator, you'll get 50% zero and 50% one. So each, each uh, measurement is like the flip of a coin. Uh, and then I should note here that uh, together with entanglement, this opens up an exponentially large Hilbert space in which you can do computation. And this is basically the reason why you, uh, quantum computing offers these, uh, you know, off offers uh, so much more computational power. And the kinds of tricks is how do you how do you solve problems in this large Hilbert space and then get out the solution in a measurable way uh, to kind of collapse it back into something classical that you can understand. OK. Uh, so going on, I'm going to go into the hardware now um, behind uh, what we're doing. So we are leveraging a lot of the techniques that we developed from the classical computing era, such as microfabrication and nanofabrication, uh, and working with wafers of silicon to build uh, superconducting circuits as opposed to semiconducting circuits. So what's a superconductor? A superconductor is a metal that loses, it doesn't have to be a metal, these are metals, they lose all electrical resistance below a certain temperature. So for example, what you'll see here on, on this chip is, is uh, two superconductors we use. The ones you can see right now is a superconductor called niobium, and it becomes a superconductor below the temperature of nine Kelvin. That's nine degrees Celsius above absolute zero. And uh, we've patterned most of our large features, uh, uh, large features on these chips uh, um, out of the niobium because it's a it's a very good superconductor. Um, so this is a five a five qubit superconducting device, very similar to the one that we put online uh, almost five years ago. Um, we still have many super uh, many superconducting qubit devices online that are free for uh, anyone to use uh, on top of our clients. Uh, let's look closer to see what's what's in here. So the qubits themselves actually live in these little squares we call pockets, and the qubits them actually look like these, uh, it looks like an equal sign that's been rotated by 90 degrees. So what you can see here uh, is, is this equal sign part represents the capacitor of the circuit. So it's just uh, two metals that have an electric field between them. And then there's a special element in between them that's much, much tinier that uh, we, we have to fabricate a different way and we make it out of a different superconductor. We make it out of aluminum, which becomes superconductor superconducting below 1.2 Kelvin. Uh, and there's a special element called a Josephine junction, which is actually a superconductor uh, with a, or, sorry, a, it's, a, it's an insulator surrounded by superconductors. So this one, for example, is aluminum and then aluminum oxide, which is an insulator and aluminum. And aluminum grows very nice oxide, or I shouldn't say nice, I should say easy. Uh, it grows a very nice oxide in, in, in a way that is very easy to fabricate these things. Even though there are 100 nanometers by 100 nanometers, there are standard techniques we can use to uh, do this. This can be done in university labs and, and has been done. Um, you know, these things have been around for 50 years or something like that. Uh, but they have a special property that they act as a nonlinear inductor. And that nonlinearity is going to be one of the keys here. Um, the inductive element, if this was just an inductor, you might remember that uh, this would be like an oscillator, like an electrical oscillator you might be familiar with. And that brings us to the other element that we're, uh, we have here, which is these uh, little squiggles right here. These squiggles are superconducting microwave resonators. So uh, essentially they're transmission lines that are uh, bounded at the end. So they're, they're capacitively coupled to things. Uh, so they can only support certain wavelengths. Um, but these coplanar waveguides uh, which is the type of transmission line they are. They're just like a 2D coax. So if you have cable TV at home, you know you have a signal pin surrounded by a, a circular conductor. This is just the same kind of thing except on a chip. Uh, so it's flattened, you would say, and you have the signal in the middle and you have the ground planes or uh, yeah, the ground planes on the side. Uh, but these superconducting resonators are used for a few different things. So we actually use them to couple to the qubits to uh, allow us to perform readout. Um, I'll kind of show you an example of that later. Uh, they're also used to couple the qubits together so that you can entangle the qubits, and we'll definitely talk about that later. Um, and they're also detuned in frequency from the qubits, so they actually serve as a uh, as a filter of sorts. It prevents the uh, it helps prevent the qubit from relax uh, from relaxing and helps prevent noise from the outside from getting in. So it it's a very nice architecture that helps us uh, like protect the qubits and isolate them well enough. Um, so let me get back to that linear versus nonlinear inductive element for a second. So these microwave transmission resonators, they are electrically the same as something we call an LC oscillator, and that's just a inductor and a capacitor in parallel with each other. This is uh, analogous to, uh, if you've taken quantum mechanics, a harmonic oscillator. Uh, and, and if you remember your um, quantum mechanics or your electrical circuits, you'll know that the energy levels of these uh, circuits are evenly spaced. That means that uh, if I if I go from the ground uh, level to the to the first excited state to the second excited state, these are all require photon transitions of the same uh, frequency. Um, 
And so what, what that means is if I want to make the ground state my uh, zero state, say, for example, and the excited state, the, the one state, I would have some problems because I would actually be exciting higher order states. And so my, 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 I wouldn't be able to store quantum information in the system very well. However, because of this Joseph injunction, we have a nonlinearity here. And now I can isolate the, the energies between the zero and the one state and the one and the two state, the second excited state, uh, from each other because now it takes photons of different energy to excite those. So can I effectively con confine this uh, anharmonic oscillator as a qubit by just using and considering the zero and one states of the oscillator? And that's exactly what we do. In fact, you can use these higher order states for things, but typically we try to avoid it as much as possible uh, because it, it, it's essentially leakage out of our computational basis. The other thing that's really important about this is that the energy corresponding to this transition is about five gigahertz. Uh, that's the uh, microwave region that we operate in. And uh, if we multiplied five gigahertz by Planck's constant and divide it by uh, Boltzmann's constant, we'll find that's a temperature of 240 millikelvin. So this is a fraction of a degree uh, Celsius above absolute zero. And it's even colder than the transition, superconducting transition temperatures of the niobium and aluminum that we're making things out of. And, and what that means is that we need to be substantially colder than 240 millikelvin because any, uh, any thermal energy is going to broaden these zero and one levels. And uh, those, uh, those, that uncertainty kind of in frequency will cause a decoherence in our system. Uh, which is why we we use these big expensive fridges uh, that get down to about 10 millikelvin, and I'll, I'll I'll show those a little bit more later. Okay, There's no questions. I'll just keep going on. Um, so uh, actually, I'd like to. I oh, have yeah. a question. Actually, right I ahead, have please. a question um, uh, regarding the uh, quantum harm, uh, harmonic uh, oscillator. I know that we have like several different states or levels. Uh, okay, or excited states. So, uh, in in in, uh, in 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 the circuit-based model, uh, we have only zero and one. In the continuous variable model, we have like zero, one, and two, and to infinity. So, how do you uh, like make the cutoff to only have like only a zero or a one state, and and that's it? How to cut the, the rest of the excited states? How right, right. how can you actually like achieve it in a quant uh, in 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 like a hardware way? You know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, basically, there are two energy scales associated with these these uh, qubits, um, and they're they're kind of determined by the Joseph injunction and the capacitor. So they're called the uh, Josephson energy and the charging energy. And what happens is, uh, and this was like actually a development because the first superconducting qubit was actually just an island of superconductor, and and uh, your zero state was, do I have an extra uh, pair of electrons here or do I not? And this was a modification of that. Um, what you can do is, is you can allow um, by by in by introducing a larger capacitance, you can tune this ratio so that you get still a very big difference um, between the zero one level and the one and two levels. So for example, uh, I said this is five gigahertz right here. The the energy between the one and the two state typically would be about four point seven gigahertz. So it's very easy to isolate yourself just at five gigahertz and do operations there without exciting anything at 4.7 gigahertz because those are 300 megahertz away. So that's very, very well within the, the bandwidth of the electronics uh, and the stuff. However, these 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 transitions do present problems and we still do research. We have some uh, very recently like in the last few months, we've we've put out a paper on what we try to do to manage these extra energy levels so that we don't get like, say, this qubit over here accidentally uh, it excites or interferes with an energy level of another one that's coupled to it. Um, but it's 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 engineering, so we have this thing called the anharmonicity, which we have to make big enough so that we can effectively not worry about exciting those uh, higher order transitions. But that's a that's a great question. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, I'd like to ask the opposite to Karim's question. Uh, sure. Can we control this multi-level excitation to get cued it? Uh, yes. Uh, that is. Is it going to be useful? Um, so this is an area of also active research, and there are proposals for using um, using uh, using the higher order levels to for to be able to do operations that are you know a little bit more generalized. Um, so I I guess and and you'll see when I talk about it is like we love this qubit because it's very very simple to understand. Um, so even just using the zero and one levels. The, the real and extreme complication comes when we couple these two qubits together. Even qubits as simple as these, the physics gets very crazy. Uh, and, and so 
considering to try to do the entangling relations with even higher order levels, it can be done. And and I know there are uh, people working on it, but it's not. It, it seems a little bit too difficult given the problems we have. But of course, it's an, it could be an exciting area of research if you're interested. And currently the 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 system we have online for anyone to use with uh, the pulse level access, which is actually the the way I interface with the quantum computers most of the time, uh, it will allow you to to explore this at least with a with a single qubit. So you can start exciting transitions up to the two level, maybe even up to the three level. I've 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 heard some people got got pretty high within the bandwidth of uh, the lab electronics. It's really interesting. Yeah, this is I mean, this is getting to the forefront of where kind of where we are. So I'm kind of bringing you up to speed on, you know, cutting day where where the research is at right now. Uh, so great questions. Um, so what I'd actually like to do is I'd like to make things a little bit more concrete. And so I go I'll go back to uh, the understanding of the block sphere and the mathematics behind quantum computing before I get back to the physics. And I do this just to tie everything together. Um, so, so you remember that the zero and one states are the north and south pole of of the uh, of the block sphere, and and we represent the zero and one in this Dirac notation, which is the physicist being lazy, and these actually just stand for the one zero and zero one column vectors. Um, so that's kind of typical, and then we have these things called the poly matrices, and these poly matrices they do a number of things. So, uh, a lot of the times you'll describe the poly matrices as being the measurements along the block sphere. Uh, uh, like how do you measure it? So for example, for superconducting qubits, um, it's almost always the case that we measure in the Z basis. And so we perform a projective measurement on the Z axis. And in particular, you can see that the zero state is the plus one eigenvalue of this, and the one state is the minus one eigenvalue of this. Uh, and likewise, you could do it on the X and the Y if you if you care to do. Um, that's nice, but but really what's more important is that these poly matrices serve to generate rotations around the block sphere. So don't worry if you haven't seen this, but if you've studied quantum mechanics, then you you know you can generate a unitary matrix, which will do a rotation of an angle theta by a normal vector n in the block sphere uh, by exponentiating this these poly matrices, um, especially this this n dot uh, sigma here, where sigma is the x y z poly matrix matrices and and essentially you get like a pretty easy and i mean it might not look easy but you'll see in a, in a second a, a relatively easy way of calculating what this unitary matrix is that performs whatever rotation you like so for example if i want to rotate around the x-axis then i just put the x poly matrix in there and i get this matrix so this is a um a unitary matrix that will achieve an uh, angle rotation of theta in the block sphere so mathematically that's what we're doing and what are we actually doing physically? So that's where I'm going to go next. And and so what we use microwave pulses. I've already alluded to these. These are going to be at five gigahertz, where the the resonant frequency of the zero one transition. And we're going to do a little shaping. We're going to make them look Gaussian, and we're going to apply them uh, into the uh, into the qubit. And uh, basically, what these pulses will do is they will rotate around an axis in the xy plane. So you can pick any axis you want. You can do the x-axis, you can do the y-axis, and the only difference between those is, especially these, those will be 90 degrees out of phase with each other. So by changing the phase of this pulse, you can change the, the axis of rotation around your block sphere. Okay, so what about Z rotations? Well, it turns out you can compose Z rotations out of X and Y rotations, but they actually come for free because in a quantum circuit, you can just, uh, whenever you see a Z rotation, you can just change the phase of a subsequent pulse. And so you can actually, when what we do is we actually compile that in uh, Qiskit in our software so that we don't actually do Z rotation. So the only perfect quantum gate is the one that you don't do. So our Z rotations are perfect. They come for free and they lower the overall single qubit gate error, um, as we can see here from randomized benchmarking experiments. So single qubits uh, are good, and that's um, ho hopefully understandable. Two qubits, uh, I told you it was going to get a little rougher, and, and here we go. Uh, hopefully it's not too bad. Uh, let's tie it back to classical computing. So um, if you've taken a circuits class, um, or uh, or computer engineering, perhaps uh, you probably have seen uh, what makes a or ask the question, what makes a universal classical computer? Uh, well, the universal means that I can express any any kind of Boolean operation I want to, so I can take these two inputs A and B, and I can construct any output I want to. And in fact, you can pick either one of these is on its own a universal uh, or, or a circuit that is that that you can build a universal quantum computer out of, and that's the not and, uh, which is the the inverse of the and. Uh, essentially, you take the and uh, the the and logic, and then you 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 invert it. So a zero and zero is is zero. Inverting that is one. 
uh, one and one is one, inverting that is zero, for example, uh, or the not or where it's very similar, except uh, zero and one is zero and zero or one is one, uh, but it's also inverted. Uh, so you can build any any Boolean logic out that you want to out of these circuits, and that's why they're called universal. Likewise, you have options for quantum computers. So um, theoretically, you, you only need single qubit rotations. I mean, I can give you all of them, uh, but uh, you, you don't even need all of them for uh, universal quantum computing. Uh, but you'll need a certain two qubit operation, and there's certain ones of these that are uh, are going to be effective for you. So the first and most popular and the one that we actually implemented at IBM is called a controlled knot. And so what does a controlled knot do? What it does is uh, it's going to flip the state of qubit two depending on whether Q1 is a zero or not. So uh, Q1 would be the first qubit, Q2 the second qubit. So my zero zero state goes to zero zero and zero one goes to zero one because zero my control qubit is in the zero state, so it does nothing. However, I have one zero, it's gonna, it's gonna go to one one because since this is one, it's going to flip the second qubit. So zero goes to one, so one zero goes to one one. Likewise, one one is going to go to one zero because the control qubit's one, it's going to flip the one to zero. And uh, uh, you can see that this is an entangling gate because you can you can see that you if you prepare the control qubit in a superposition so that you'd have the state say zero zero um, plus one zero. Oh, and a lot of the times I'm just going to assume the qubit start in the zero state because that's always true for our qubits because they thermally relax. Um, and uh, and so I assume they start in zero, so I can take the control qubit, prepare it in a superposition of zero and one, so I have zero, zero plus one, zero, and I apply a C naught, then I have the state zero, zero plus one, one, which is a bell state. It's a maximally entangled state. Um, so it's very easy to see how you can get entanglement from these kinds of truth tables, um, but this isn't the only one, and I, I'll, I'll show later and, and, and see why this is dependent on the physics of your devices. Uh, but but this is kind of where everyone differs. So these are all possible with, with uh, superconducting qubits, um, but it depends on your architecture. So another popular one is called a C phase gate, uh, and that means controlled phase also. And what this does is it only, uh, it leaves all the states alone unless both your qubits are in the one state. It puts a minus sign in front of that state. And uh, that minus sign corresponds to a 180 degree rotation uh, or phase, which is why it's called a phase gate. Um, there's also an I swap gate which is where you swap the qubits, the, the, the Q1 and Q2, you swap their states. And then if you actually perform a swap, you get the imaginary number square root of negative one in front of it. So um, these are implementable in different ways, and I just kind of wrote their equivalent uh, circuits. Um, and they're used by different architectures. And this is kind of where everyone goes off on their own with regards to superconducting qubits. So uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about how we do this in the lab and uh, physically. Uh, we use a gate called cross resonance, and the cross resonance gives us a ZX operation. And so we're going to go back and think about the poly matrices Z and the poly matrix X. We're going to tensor product those together to get a bigger matrix. And then we're going to essentially what this ZX operation does is it rotates around this bigger matrix. So you get when you do that exponentiation, all that stuff, I, I did the math and you can see these sines and cosines in this big matrix. But one of the things that you can kind of see uh, is that the rotation of the target will depend on the control. So, so by that, I mean, if you look at this top left block of this uh, matrix, you can see that that corresponds to a positive X rotation, and that will be acting on the subspace of qubits in which the control is in the zero state. However, this uh, lower right block corresponds to a negative X rotation, and so, and that also corresponds to the subspace in which the control qubit is in the one. So you can mathematically see that the, the direction of rotation of the target qubit is going to depend on the state of the control. Or, because of the corresponding subspaces. Uh, so uh, let's go with go through it with block spheres. I kind of like this example. So we're going to start with our qubits in zero, uh, our control qubit in zero, our target qubit in zero, and we'll start with the purple vectors. Uh, so what happens in the case that we're in zeros, just considering the purple one right now, and I apply the cross resonance, my target qubit state is going to start rotating to the right. And, uh, and, and that will be the effect, and we'll keep going depending on how long I apply the cross resonance for. Uh, OK, so now forget about that, and we go back to the qubits both being in zero, but now I'm going to prepare the control qubit in one, so it's in the blue. My target qubit's in blue, but it started in whoops, started in zero, and I apply the cross resonance with the control qubit in the one state, then my target qubit is going to rotate to the left. So now you can see, depending on the state of the control qubit, my target qubit's going to rotate in one direction or the other. And so what I can do with the control qubit is I prepared in a superposition, this yellow vector right here, 
where it's a superposition of zero and one, and now applying a cross resonance to that yellow vector, my target qubit's going to rotate both left and right at the same time, which is why I can't depict it with a single vector. Uh, that's why it's a, it's kind of hard to see how this entanglement works, but um, that's kind of the idea of how you get this dependence, um, or you get this these these multiple effects on the target qubit by way of superposition and entanglement. So how we actually do this, and I'll go into a little bit more physics detail, is that we apply a pulse to the control qubit Q1 at the frequency of the target qubit, and these guys have been coupled by a uh, microwave transmission line resonator. Um, <clears throat> yeah, specifically, we'll go into a little bit more of what this looks like on a device. Uh, the reason we like this is it's all microwave, which means we don't need other control knobs. We don't need to have extra um, like DC wires for applying magnetic field, what we call flux pulses, which is com another common uh, use. Uh, so it, it allows us to have kind of simpler, cleaner devices with higher coherence, which is why we like it. So uh, what basically what happens is we have this microwave transmission line resonator. It, it induces a coupling we just call J. That value is around three megahertz or so. Um, what I what I didn't tell you is that these qubits, because they are fabricated by this aluminum oxide growing in a chamber, they are like a it's like a glass, and these uh, qubits all turn out with different glasses, so they have different frequencies associated with them. Uh, so the control qubit here we'll call it uh, Q1, and we'll have a frequency omega one. And we'll use that for single qubit rotations of Q1. And then Q2 will have a different frequency, omega 2, and that will be used for single qubit rotations of the target qubit. However, our cross resonance is going to be at the frequency of Q2, the target, but it's going to be applied at Q1. And that's how we get rotations. So one of the ways to see this is to use something we call an le energy level diagram in physics, where you have the state in which both qubits are zero, uh, one where the target's in one. Uh, and the controls in zero, one where the targets, the controls in one and the target is in zero, and one where they're both excited. Uh, basically, these dotted lines would, would be their energies if they weren't interacting, but because you're interacting the qubits with each other, they become somewhat hybridized with each other. So you might remember this concept from chemistry where you have hybrid bonds forming with each other between, say, S and P orbitals. Uh, so these, these qubits become slightly hybridized with each other just so much we, we call it dispersive. Uh, the dispersive regime where they're slightly hybridized and their energy levels shift uh, by an order of j squared over two delta. That delta there is the detuning, so that's the difference in frequencies. And that needs to be like at least 50 megahertz or so. And I told you j was about five megahertz, so it's a, uh, or sorry, about three megahertz. So this is kind of a substantial weakening. Um, so it's a, a very small amount of hybridization, but essentially the one zero state becomes a little bit like the zero one state and vice versa. And so what you do is you'll drive transitions. Um, depending on the state of your control qubit, it'll be driving this transition or this transition, and you'll get different signs because of these wave functions. Uh, so that's the physics of what that happens, and that's and actually it gets even more complicated than that. So there's a lot of research in this. This doesn't give you a pure ZX interaction, but it's it's kind of close enough for uh, what we want to talk about. That's that's the interaction that we're extracting from it. All right, so I'll keep going. I think I'm going to give a lot of uh, details about the things that surround. Uh, without going into too much detail, the details of the things that surround the architecture right, right now. Uh, so we're going to put the math away for a little bit, but uh, let's see. Well, I think this was almost two years ago now. We released uh, the IBM Q System 1, where we have integrated all the components of a quantum computer into this very fancy nine foot by nine foot by nine foot glass box uh, and called it System 1. And, and we actually have this at our lab in New York. Uh, and we, we also have one that floats around to uh, conferences and, and, and the like, so people can take a look at it. Uh, but me, I'm more interested in the inside of uh, what's going on. And so uh, there's a number of things that are happening here. Uh, one of these things is we have uh, the cryogenic component. So we have a cryostat here. We call it dilution refrigerator. Uh, we have electrical components, and then we have uh, these gas handling components, which handle the, uh, the helium gases that are used to cool the system. Uh, so what do we have in here? Well, there's a lot of concerns in making this thing stable, and I can just give you a brief idea of how this works. Um, so in order to get extremely cold, you need to get really cold, and that used to mean you would take everything and you would dunk it in liquid helium, which is about four Kelvin, four degrees Celsius above absolute zero. Uh, but luckily we have these dry systems now that allow us to cool, uh, start the cooling um, with just electricity only. And in fact, uh, everything gets colder as you go down in these go down with these plates. So it goes from warm to cold and all the coldest is at the bottom, and you can see that's where we put all our fun stuff. Uh, but using just this uh, pulse tube compressor, we can get the top uh, plate to 50 Kelvin and the second plate to 3 Kelvin. Uh, so already you're 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 really cold. 
Uh, and that's just using a closed cycle of helium-4 uh, in a closed loop. So it's just using electricity. Uh, so that's very nice, but it makes a loud sound that kind of annoys people, but I don't know. It, it's so much easier to, to use that than liquid helium, so I don't mind. Um, the other cycle is something called the dilution cycle where we use a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. Now, why do we care about that? It's because when you get these things cold enough, they become different states of matter because helium-3 quantum mechanically is a fermion and helium-4 is a boson. So when you get them cold enough, they become different states of matter and they actually phase separate. Uh, the, the, the helium-3 part is called the helium-3 rich part. It is a quantum fluid and the helium-4 part is a, is, a, is a super fluid. It's the bosonic part. And they separate like oil and water, and essentially this refrigerator pumps the helium-3 from the helium-3 rich phase through the helium-3 dilute phase, which is mostly the helium-4 superfluid, and then outside of this big pipe we call the still, and then it goes into this gas handling unit you can't see and gets recycled. And then by, by doing that, and this process is done in this little silver chamber right here called the mixing chamber, um, you can get down to 10 millikelvin you know, pretty easily uh, in, in a couple days it takes to cool down. And we have all the other fun stuff going on, kind of hanging off that plate that is at 10 millikelvin. Uh, the other thing we have going on is we have all the electrical components, which are kind of the classical control components, which are very important uh, for operating quantum bits. Uh, a lot of them we build in-house, um, such as F FPGA field, field programmable gate array based um, um, uh, uh, so I should say um, digital to digital to analog converters and analog to digital converters we use for bringing the signals back. We have very stable microwave sources that output sine waves at the gigahertz frequencies, and a lot of like uh, a lot of other microwave components that we we contribute to put these together. So this is like for 20 qubits right here, and we've made a lot more progress. Um, I think I have a picture later or in the supplement later I can show you what the more modern stuff looks like. Um, but that's essentially how we control it, and and we take a lot of care because you need to wire these things up you know very carefully uh, but some of the important things that that go in there are things that are you know areas of active research that that you know us and other academic um, research groups still work on and and one of these is something called quantum limited amplifiers and by quantum limited amplifiers i mean there's a minimum amount of noise that it, that you have to add to um to a signal to um, get any gain and that's half a photon at the signal frequency, and we can build amplifiers that are based on superconductors that can achieve that. Um, two kinds of them, two kinds of them are th ones called traveling wave parametric amplifiers. They use a non-linearity non of, a, of a medium, such as a kinetic inductance superconductor or a metamaterial made out of Josephson junctions um, to, to essentially get a nonlinear effect. We also have something called a Josephson parametric converter we like to use at IBM. Uh, so I work on a little bit can of I, these. Can I ask you something here? Absolutely. Uh, sure. So uh, you're saying something about non nonlinearities in this uh, limited amplifier. So uh, is it related to the Kerr effect? Or yes, exactly. Is it something else? Yes, it is. It's the Kerr can effect. You, can you please elaborate more on this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we are using um, we are using a uh, these so it's essentially for the qubits. It's actually very similar to the qubits. The qubits we use the nonlinearity to effectively separate the zero, one, and one, two energy levels, so we can use the uh, the ground and excited state as a qubit. These are very similarly fabricated, but they use the they use the nonlinearity of say a Josephson junction to achieve three or three wave mixing or four wave mixing. So what happens is you can um, you can get a, a signal, which are signals that um. I didn't say it, but it's about seven gigahertz. Like I said, it was detuned from the qubits, which are about five gigahertz. Uh, so we we do our readout around seven gigahertz, and that would be our signal that would be incident on one of these JPCs. And then through another RF line, we would apply a pump, and that pump is going to be very strong. And because of the nonlinearity of that JPC, it will in instigate a three-wave mixing process where uh, a photon at that uh, a, a photon at seven gigahertz, which is our signal. Uh, and an idler photon or and that pump will produce an amplified signal at seven gigahertz and an idler photon at 10 megahertz. So seven gigahertz plus 10 gigahertz is 17 gigahertz. So you always get an extra kind of idler type photon out of these process. Uh, but it's very similar to like parametric amplifiers and optics um, um, and the like. It's just how do you achieve these kinds of mixing? And this is still like an area of you know active research in, in the field, like making these JPCs better integrating them to actually use their nonlinear effects for other kinds of uh, interesting things as uh, something I've worked on like um, you can get uh, constructive and destructive interference using the nonlinear effects to get uh, non reciprocal microwave devices which are very important as well. Uh, I hope that answered your question. 
Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Please All continue. Right, great. Yeah, no problem. Um, so yeah, these these are you know super interesting fields on their own way. And one of my coworkers, um, I work with, he's like the one of the big experts on this. So I help him out with building things out of the JPCs. Um, another thing you might uh, imagine is we had to, we have to shield these qubits very much from the outside environment. So we package these qubits uh, typically in something like a a a printed circuit board, and, and this is still similar to how things are done today. If you've seen uh, our press releases, uh, this is kind of an older style, so I can show it to you. Uh, we don't show as much of our new hardware uh, as, as it gets more competitive. Uh, but basically what this does is it has little transmission lines inside of the printed circuit board that, that deliver the signals to and from the chip through these coax cables. So these are just like coax, like I was talking, like the ones you're more familiar with. Uh, they're just a little bit more, uh, they're a little smaller so they can support higher frequencies. Uh, and basically, these things live inside this can. This can is made of a, of a material called um, uh, cryoperm, uh, and that expels magnetic fields. So the magnetic fields won't bother our superconducting qubits. It's not as, well, it's it's still a problem, but we since we're, our qubits are relatively insensitive to magnetic field, it's not such a problem. Um, then these RF lines need to be light tight, so we surround everything in Echosorb. Uh, this is a composite, an uh, iron nanomaterial composite, uh, epoxy, and this will kind of shield our signals and, and prevent any light from getting in to our, um, uh, into our devices. And, and you can imagine we're always thinking about black body radiation and the thermal radiation that's just generated from things inside of our fridge. It's one of the cryogenic concerns that, that you'll have. So this is something we learned along the way. Um, this was learned a little bit before I joined IBM, um, but I know that someone won a $20 bet for, for this. So that was, that's good. And uh, and sometimes we we like to have fun in the lab and and, and place friendly bets with each other. Um, so what I want to show you here is what the measurement looks like. So you have say his kit, you can generate a measurement pulse from a computer, uh, these signals to measure these two qubits of say a bell state, which is then going to generate the waveforms and RF signals and mix them together to get sine waves. And those signals are going to go into the top of the fridge. They always go into the top and they're going to go down and they're going to get thermalized at each layer of the stage. And they're going to finally get to the qubit chip where they interact with those readout resonators I was talking about. And then depending on the state of the qubit that the qubits collapsed into, there's going to be a phase shift that's imparted. That's going to be a state dependent phase shift. And then that state dependent phase shift is going to be amplified out, down converted back and digitized to something where it can be classified as a zero or one. Um, I hope that wasn't too fast, uh, but that's, uh, basically how the, how the measurement works. So you have a signal that's very, very small going in, uh, and then you have to, you know, have that signal interact quantum mechanically, and then you need to amplify that very, very small signal so you can get it back out of the fridge and, uh, and, and deal with it using classical electronics and, um, and digitization and classification. So there's a lot of um, signals work that also goes in line with uh, quantum computing as well. And this is stuff that you can explore with say Qiskit Pulse and with the systems that we have uh, online for anyone to use. Uh, so we, tr we try to make it so that, you know, everyone can do research on it. So hopefully I can move to the next. Ah, okay, um, uh, what about uh, Qiskit Metal? Uh, will it be like integrated into Qiskit itself so that uh, people can start uh, like like developing new uh, new quantum de devices itself, or uh... so that's a great question. Um, I can't announce it yet, but stay tuned. Um, I, don't, <laughs> I could talk about Kismet Metal here, but you, you're already familiar with what we're our wares. Um, let me finish. This is my last uh, slide, and then I can okay, uh, take questions about sorry. all these kinds of stuff. So, uh, so Thank basically, um, as a summary, I just wanted to tell you the kinds of metrics that we're concerned with in the lab when we're building these things. So, I was telling you how we build the Joseph injunctions, and we uh, generate control based on the frequencies of the qubits. Um, the quantum information, the lifetime of the information is limited by decoherence and relaxation. So there's kind of both uh, um, relaxation and dephasing cause decoherence and and it causes our, our our information to wash away within a certain amount of time, which is pretty short. Um, like I was saying on the previous slide, these signals are going to be integrated or digitized and integrated and classified. And so you can define these uh, this measurement by by these the quantum signals that you get. And then um, you have the interaction speeds. They're going to be limited by, in one in part, the anharmonicity between your one and your two or F state. Uh, so that 300 megahertz I was telling you about, that's going to put a limit on the bandwidth of the signals that we can put in. So it it, it, it increases the amount of time uh, our signals take. And then that means we have more decoherence. And then we also have the interaction rates between qubits, for example, that tell us how fast can we entangle the two qubits. 
and that's actually one of the things about cross resonance is relatively slow. It's about 10 times longer than a uh, single qubit uh, operation. Um, so this is just kind of a flavor of the uh, kinds of things that we care about in the lab. So I'd be happy to talk, take questions and maybe answer more about the um, more about the technical details of these things. And so I'll start with the Kiskit metal question is Kiskit metal is a the kind of newest uh, element of Kiskit and it is uh, essentially something that unifies the uh, the analysis. So when you when you build these quantum circuits, you can think of them as electrical circuits. You can think about them as being laid out on a chip and you can think about converting between of those got those thoughts with electromagnetic models. And then you have this other way of thinking, which is with the Hamiltonian, which is how physicists think about things like how do I want to operate on my qubits? You do that with the Hamiltonian, and then how do I take the components of that Hamiltonian and make sense out of a circuit that will do that? And Kiskit Metal is essentially this new open source, um, this new open source part of Kiskit that kind of ties all these things together. So it allows you to go from kind of a circuit model to a uh, finite element or like a laid out model on a chip or something that can be simulated with um, ANSYS HFSS or ADS or one of the uh, electromagnetic solvers that are out there. Uh, and analyzed with circuit models, analyzed at different microwave networks, analyzed with Hamiltonians such as uh, uh, libraries such as Q-tip, for example, and uh, helps you lay out these chips so that this kind of workflow is is relatively seamless. So I can't make any announcement about it today, but I'd say stay tuned, and uh, I hope that and that question will be answered for you uh, relatively shortly. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So um, I think that we have several questions uh, in the chat here, so I will uh, read them one by one. Cool. Uh, the first one is, uh, so every chip uh, has only one qubit and they are connected via superconducting microwave resonators. So uh, that is the question. Oh, so, so each chip has several qubits, uh, but they are all connected via microwave resonators. So yeah, you can see them here. So this is the five qubits. Each one of them are in the pockets and they're all connected. I mean, they're not all connected to each other. So there's a some amount of limited connectivity in the superconducting qubit architecture um, because we 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 have to be planar at the moment. And this is something actually because we can you can do some sort of integration where you kind of go to two planes or multiple planes, but this lithographic process is inherently kind of a planar thing. So they have to be defined by essentially a topology where they can be connected with each other. So you can see here that like this center qubit is connected to this qubit. In fact, the center qubit's connected to all the qubits. It's kind of like forms an X topology or except no, these qubits are connected to these qubits. So this is something we call a bow tie. Um, mm -hmm. But you can see that not all qubits are connected to each other. So this qubit and this qubit are not connected to each other. This qubit and this qubit are not connected to each other. And you can see like why, at least over here, is because you need the readout resonator for this qubit here needs to way, go to the uh, outside of the chip. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we cannot sure. see your mouse. You know, we oh. cannot see the, the pointer on the screen, so it would be if great can... if you can activate it. Uh, do you know how to do that? Um, it is your. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it this down here? Oh. Yeah, I got it. OK, OK. Do you great. see now? OK, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So the center qubit is connected to all the qubits like via these these connections that are mediated by these uh, microwave resonators. We call them bus resonators when they connect qubits. Um, and these qubits here, so this makes the bow tie part, are connected, and these two qubits are here are connected. But these qubits are not connected, and these two qubits are not connected. And you can see why, because we need a microwave readout resonator for this qubit, and it splits the plane, so we can't couple those two together. Where, whereas we could have if we wanted to on this side. This way, we can't. So you're limited in some sort of topology. Now, we're pursuing integration strategies that allow us more flexibility, but typically all the qubits um, are going to be on on a single chip. But but definitely an area of um, research is is how to com how to get um, how to get quantum information between multiple chips, and this is something we call the quantum interconnects challenge. Uh, and and it's, we we talked about it as part of our roadmap at oh, we released over the summer of, of last year. And there's there's a couple ways to do this. You can try and keep everything cold and in the microwave regime, and you can figure out ways of coupling fridges together, uh, which which was done by a group in uh, ETH Zurich. Or you can you can do something else, which which we're doing in at IBM, which is we try to convert the microwave photon to an optical photon, which we can then take out of the lab and. Uh, um, through a fiber optic and there's very, very little losses in a fiber optic and then we can take that to another fridge or you know to the 
to another city because the fiber optics can travel quite far uh, and then put it in another fridge and, and convert it back down to the microwave frequency. Uh, I'm sorry, m maybe my, my question is, is really silly, but can't we do this on a sphere in, in a 3D, not on a plane? Oh, uh, I mean, a lot of the ideas actually came from um, what if you could do this like on a torus, you know, uh, the the some of the original quantum error correction codes. The fabrication is uh, it's very tough not to do on a in a planar manner. You just get a lot more challenges of trying to make like very pristine materials in a uniform way on on a crazier surface like a sphere. Um, but these, you know, these are challenges we're looking at, um, such as say being able to put signals through the silicon, for example, those are so those are things we call through silicon vias, and that would allow us to access, say, the backside of the chip, uh, and that could be really useful for um, for integrating these technologies. So we're we're kind of working on everything on all kinds of fronts because there's a lot of challenges to solve, and there's a you know, like you said, a lot of ways of of doing them. Um, actually, I have a question. Why, why, why did you uh, retire Vigo and Valencia? They they are really uh, popular, and we were getting good results on them. So we are going to repeat all the work again. So why yeah. did you decide so to retire? We're trying to update our systems to a better uh, to higher quantum volume. Essentially, I think that was why it was done. Is um, I think we want to make sure all of our systems have at least quantum volume 32. And so we, we have been retiring not just our smaller systems, but some of our larger systems as well. Um, and 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 we're we're actually providing better systems. So the quantum volume will be higher. The qubits will have more coherence as we're going along. The gate should be faster. The measurement fidelity should be better. So we're trying to make continual improval and it just turns out we run out of fridges, so we can't keep them all cold. Uh, but I hope you enjoy using the new ones. Uh, but we are going to repeat the work. This is, this is a problem. Yeah, yeah, I know. Oh, I mean, no problem, this, no problem. We this, enjoy this. this. Yeah, I know this. This happens. It's it's unfortunate, but it, we we have to call it. You know, given our deployment schedule. Okay. Uh, th there is another question, which I I, I think that uh, uh, I think it's about uh, you know the higher specific states or higher eigenstates. Uh, he, he is asking about how to manipulate them. Yes, this one uh, in the harmonic oscillator. Yeah, uh, he is asking about how to manipulate higher states. Oh, that's a great question. So this is something you can do with Qiskit Pulse. Um, and uh, what I what I what you what you can do is so generally you're given a pulse. You're given pulse level control of the system and and what will what we typically provide you in say the circuit based model is we can you can do an x you can flip between these two you can do a rotation in the block sphere between these two but those will all occur at the the, the local oscillator frequency which corresponds to this frequency between the zero and one so say five gigahertz um, what you can do is if you want to operate the two state first you need to you need to get to the one state so you can apply we call it an x pulse or a pi pulse um, that will take you from zero to one. So first you excite yourself to the one state, and then you can use pulse level control to figure out the frequency of this transition. And I already know it's going to be about 4.7 4 gigahertz, but using Qiskit Pulse, you can change the local oscillator frequency. If you go to our textbook, uh, so I'm very excited about, uh, we have an open source textbook we call the Qiskit textbook. If you look at chapter six, that's about, um, um, that's about using uh, Qiskit Pulse to, to look at these kind of device physics. And I, I helped with writing a lot of that chapter. So uh, if you look in that chapter, I think it's six, I think it's the first section in that chapter. There'll, it will give a demonstration on how you can do this. So you can figure out what the enharmonicity, what the, what the one, two transition frequency is by using something we call a spectroscopy uh, experiment. And, and that essentially, um, me, what, what that essentially means is you first excite the qubit into the one state, and then you apply a pulse of some varying frequency, something around 4.7. So you'll do a sweep, say, between 4.65 and 4.75, and see if you see an excitation. Then you'll see the excitation uh, to this two state. That will also be apparent through the same kinds of measurements we do of these microwave resonators. And actually, we've we've been giving, um, going through more and more, and actually doing some like classification of these states in, in what we call the IQ space, which is the space in which the uh, the qubits have been um, 
they've been digitized, they've been uh, kerneled, which means uh, at that point you've integrated your data into a point in the IQ space, which is kind of the microwave engineer's complex plane, and then you need to discriminate it. If you do something called measurement level one in Pulse, you can get the IQ data back, and um, my coworker, um, my colleague Helena actually has some publicly available, um, uh, she has some publicly available notebooks which will do this and do all these kinds of spectroscopy where you can look at the zero, one, and two level, and then you can apply different discriminators to it. And uh, actually, we were just talking about adding this to the Kiskit textbook uh, to that chapter six, um, but we already have some demonstrations about how you can how you can um, play with it uh, in, the, in the existing chapters, but we're looking at improving those. Uh, but thanks, that's a great question. That's great, that's great. Okay, there is another one uh, which says, uh, based on uh, the ongoing research, how does the future of high temperature uh, temperature uh, superconductor, uh, superconductors look like for quantum computers, or is it too early to tell? Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a great question. Um, high temperature superconductors are very interesting, and, uh, and, and basically they're kind of complex um, composite materials. Typically, we think of um, these ones called the cuprates, which are kind of like they're ceramics. They're kind of like what your coffee cups are made out of. Like, like. Um, uh, basically, the interesting thing is, even though high temperature superconductivity was discovered um, over 30 years ago, we still don't have a working theory of of, of how it works. But it it does like promise to open up uh, technological advances, especially in delivering power. Uh, maybe if we're doing higher. Uh, higher temperature quantum computing. So uh, basically the materials that you make, these these complex oxides, uh, the cuprates, they're very fragile and very brittle. And so it's very difficult to fabricate them and turn them into Josephson junctions uh, and to control that in a reasonable way. It can be done and has been done. It's just very difficult. And then the benefits you get uh, out of the higher temperature superconductors is say, well, it would be good because you'd have less effect of like quasi particles, which are unpaired Cooper pairs. So I should say in superconductors, the electrons pair up as Cooper pairs, which is why they don't dissipate uh, resistance and they don't dissipate heat because there's no resistance uh, because they're paired up. Um, in uh, so you think of these existing as a, as a superconducting gap, and I think for high temperature superconductors, you would get a much larger gap, and that would prevent quasi particles from from ruining things. Um, and you could operate at higher frequencies. Now, one of the other problems that I didn't mention is that even operating at higher frequencies, it gets a lot more expensive. So as you go from <clears throat> five and seven gigahertz to you know, anything, anything much above 20 gigahertz, all of a sudden the electronics are much, much more expensive and your price per qubit shoots up uh, until you get to like say, say 100 gigahertz and you're kind of in the realms of like radio astronomy. And, and, and uh, I, guess, I guess a lot of, uh, a lot of Internet of Things is going on at 94 gigahertz and the design mm -hmm. constraints and everything you have to worry about at those high frequencies, everything gets a lot more painful. Uh, just even from a classical uh, um, from a classical perspective, even even just like the 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 effects that you have in normal copper wires start to be a problem. Uh, so so that's a good question. So it's also like it's very possible, but it's it's very difficult to do and it's very kind of unclear where the benefits would lie. Um, I do kind of think the the same technique, which is molecular beam epitaxy, which is essentially allows you to do a atom atom by atom, like kind of atomic growth or layer by layer atomic growth. Um, that technique I think could be very useful in um, in making Joseph injunctions and other materials. And, and I know several research groups that are working on um, different schemes to do that, um, but not particularly the high temperature superconductors. They're just a little bit harder to work with. OK, thank you so much. Uh, there is like l last one question, actually. One last oh, question. I, 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 sure, um, yeah, uh, and I'll, uh, I, can, I can add one more thing to that is, is all of these processes we're doing at our research fab in New York, and it's all on like eight inch wafer processes. So this is kind of an industrial scale thing we're already doing, and it's very difficult to do industrial scale things using even in even in BE processes. It's very difficult. Uh, OK, I'm ready for the next one. OK. Uh, I think uh, this one will be very beneficial for 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 everyone and even for uh, for the researchers and uh, the school students. Um, can can you describe uh, the, the metric of uh, quantum volume? Okay, and based on uh, on this metric, uh, how can we compare between 
for example, ion trap, uh, ion trap uh, architecture or the superconducting architecture, and how uh, can this actually uh, like um, like crystallize the the idea of quantum advantage itself? Oh, I don't have. Sorry, I don't have quantum volume slides in here. Okay, I can give you a. Yeah, I don't. Okay. Sorry, but uh, I'll just talk to that anyway. So there's only a few minutes. So. Um, Quantum volume is a very like rigorously mathematical uh, and kind of algorithm for determining how powerful a quantum computer is. Basically, what you're looking at is something we call a square circuit. A square circuit is a is a is, is you can imagine you have two two things like when you have a quantum circuit is you have the number of qubits on one axis and then you have how deep is your circuit on the other axis. And so each um, essentially each unit of depth for us is how many arbitrary uh, two qubit operations and permutations you can do, which essentially means how many arbitrary uh, operations can I do between any two qubits uh, that I've specified here? And I make it square by I make the same number of qubits and the same units of depth. And so each unit of depth is a single arbitrary operation between two qubits. We call this random SU force. Mm -hmm. um, so basically we get a bunch of different uh, circuits that are that are randomized and we decompose them onto the architecture we have and we run the circuit and we can calculate how well um, we can calculate the result already with the classical computer and just doing the unitary matrices or using our chasm simulator or whatever um, and uh, we can compare the output of the the quantum computer to the classical to the expected result of what a quantum computer would give if it's perfect now we only take the statistically significant uh, part of that, which is all of the all of the bit strings, meaning all of the results that you could possibly get with some probability that are above the median probability. We call these heavy outputs. And so if you take uh, the heavy outputs that match up with the statistic, statistically significant ones that you calculate uh, with a perfect quantum computer, uh, meaning you've done it with a classical computer, then you can get um, some number and that kind of number corresponds to how well did you did you calculate. Um, if you had a perfect quantum computer, that number is typically about 85% because you've thrown away a lot of the statistically insignificant results. Uh, and we say that we were successful with that circuit if we were able to replicate these bit strings with a probability greater than two thirds. Um, so that's the mathematically rigorous definition. And then we we would also say that we've done enough circuits to be you know, statistically significant for that circuit. And then we run enough circuits so that we could say we're statistically significantly above that uh, two thirds marker. Um, so that's what quantum volume is. And uh, sorry, and, and let me, sorry, I didn't define quantum volume. So the quantum, the log of the quantum volume is that is the that width or depth of that square circuit. So it's square, so it doesn't matter which one you take. So for example, mm -hmm. uh, we have quantum volume 128 now, that would be a uh, seven qubits with a depth of seven um, because that's the log base two of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so our quantum volume, because it's exponential, so we take two to the number, two to the depth, essentially. Um, so that's exactly how you calculate it. Now, uh, we talked about different kinds of, uh, there's, a, there's a number of other things that go into quantum volume, and mainly now it's errors. It's not the number of qubits, because we have systems that are much, much bigger than seven qubits. Um, but it's the errors, and they come and swamp us out. And it's basically because we have these random circuits are going to be you know, decomposed. Typically, you can always do one with three C naughts. Uh, between two qubits, assuming that those two qubits you can couple together. And uh, like I was showing before, those qubits aren't necessarily coupled together because there not might be a physical readout resonator on that or bus resonator on the surface to couple those two qubits. So you might have to do swaps. So all of a sudden, these operations start getting a lot more expensive because swaps have three C naughts. And C naughts are kind of our main source of error. They're about 1% per C naught. And uh, basically, our topology. You know, doesn't allow you to connect all those qubits together, and so we have to execute swaps, or we try to execute and map our circuits onto the existing topology we have in a very, very smart way. And this is a difficult problem, and it's kind of like uh, what well, we call it transpilation, which is a very interesting part of Qiskit. That um, a very interesting part of uh, the kind of the Qiskit of like I start with this arbitrary random circuit that I have, and then I need to map it to an actual physical circuit where I have actual gates that I can natively do on this architecture, and that's very non-trivial thing and I, I spend a bit of time thinking about that. Um, so the 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 other comparison between technologies, if you have something like ions or say cold neutral atoms, there are certain gate operations where you can do global gates. 
or you can even do global entangling gates in the case of the uh, molnar sorensen gates with ions. And that's because the ions have a sec second degree, a second quantum degree of freedom. They don't just have the electrical degree of freedom like the ground or excited state of the atom or of the ion. And they also have emotional degree of freedom. So these ions are trapped, they're moving around and they've been cooled to essentially zero degree Kelvin. And so they only have the emotional degree of uh, freedom has been quantized as well. And so you can actually excite that and you can use that to interact with other other ions in order to do uh, entangling in a, in a more efficient way. So in a way, ions, even though they're in a line, they have all to all connectivity. And so in some measures of quantum volume, they're very advantageous. Um, now we know the benefits of our architectures uh, is our, ours are very fast, uh, whereas the ions are a bit slower. Um, so if you kind of take the ratio of gate time to um, coherence time, it's kind of about the same. Um, but we can be even faster uh, electronically because our 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 gates are so short uh, that we can do a lot within the lifetime of a of a circuit. But some of these more complicated algorithms, for example, we have to kind of smear out. So we we think with that um, by being able to compare architectures, it, it should be able to compare any gate based model. It's a pretty fair comparison because it it gives it gives uh, benefits to uh, possibility of having other gates or different kinds of connectivity or something like that. Or you could even think about like modular connectivity. What if you could actually move your qubits around and 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 do stuff with that? And and these are, you know, technologies that are are, you know, coming around in in labs and and with companies now. So it, it'll be exciting to see what we can do and how we can compare them. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to, to have you and have this talk and and uh, I think that everyone um, is, is happy with this. Uh, actually, the, the, there are two more questions. Do, do you have time for the, for them? Or, yeah, uh, yeah, I can I, I can do them pretty quick. OK, sure. the first one is, uh, how do you control noise and coherence? Because adding more qubits produce more noise and error. So how can you suppress them? Yeah, so you, you've got to be very controlled about how you let the qubits talk to each other mm -hmm. uh, in a way. So, so there's kind of like, the qubit, qubit, like kind of noise or like crosstalk is is one of the big problems, and and that's uh, we try and control through. Um, we can do some tuning of the frequencies, and that's kind of the biggest effect that we can, or the biggest impact we can do is have this control of the frequencies. So we can try and predict the frequencies of the qubit before we get them cold, uh, and we can modify them before we get them cold. Uh, so that's some research we put out last year. Um, another thing we do is we simulate all of these things so that we try to make a pristine microwave network. So essentially put the qubits in a Faraday cage so the signals don't kind of go around everywhere. Um, thermal noise is another thing. So you have to be like very careful about the cryogenic materials that you uh, that you have. You want to make sure your qubits are extremely well anchored uh, to the fridge, but we also know that the qubits aren't exactly at 10 millikelvin. They're a little bit above, um, so they're not actually getting as cold as we need to. Um, so that's another source of noise. Uh, electronics noise is, is something we need very stable sources. Uh, so, so any like kind of amplitude or phase noise on the control is, is a source of noise we need to get rid of. In fact, most of uh, all our problems are, are different kinds of noise manifesting themselves in our system. So that's what we think about a lot. Oh, and different ways to classify the noise. So quantum volume is good for a metric of comparing um, between different kinds of qubit architectures, but it's not very great for, well, it, it can be, it's very sensitive to certain kinds of sources of noise, that's true. Um, but we use other kinds of benchmarking techniques for different sources of noise. You, you can you want to try and isolate uh, the source of noise and measure the source of noise that you're interested in. So just the field of benchmarking is something we have several researchers thinking about. OK, that's great. Um, uh, are they like uh, like the ones like um, Zlat Kumenev and, and Olivia Lanes? <laughs> I don't think they work on noise so much. Um, you know, Zlatko works on metal a lot, and you know, uh -huh. Olivia used to work on parametric amplifiers, but she's she's doing a lot of other stuff these days, including metal. Um, I, I'm thinking uh, my my buddy Jin Sung Kim. He did the um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the short the short Kiss Kit intro to Kiss Kit videos um, that yeah. he released. Uh -huh. He he's he does his work on benchmarking. Um, Seth okay. Merkel does the theory of benchmarking. Um, those are the kind of two people I, I talk to when I want to talk about benchmarking. OK, the last question is uh, is about, uh, I think, quantum memories. And uh, the question is, is uh, the information storing idea in this superconducting qubit architecture depending on the difference in energy levels of the used elements? Uh, so the question, like, 
like rephrasing it, uh, do we store the information like uh, in different levels? Do we use different levels for storing the information or we store yeah. it a different way? Yeah, that's a great question. So right now we have like no separate memory. So our compute, our computation and our memory is the same thing. We're only using the zero and one levels and we're only keeping it in those levels. And that's in contrast to other kinds of systems. And I'll go back to, to atoms or ions, for example, that mm -hmm. have a lot of, they have a rich um, energy level structure and you can find certain kinds of, um, I think they call them shelf states or or there'd be like kind of memory states where you can, you can hide your memory in some state you know. Uh, that mm -hmm. that's not going to deco here, and then you can do some other operations, and you can bring it back in or something. Um, okay. So that's something that can be done in some quantum systems, but not we not one we typically use. And that's because we we typically only have bad things happen when we go to the higher energy levels. We are more sensitive to charge noise, for example. Um, we 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 have started using the two level for measurements because we we get a suppressed amount of relaxation by measuring in the two level as opposed to the one level. Uh, but as memories, we just you're typically more sensitive to charge noise. Um, but let me take that a step back because there are different kinds of superconducting qubits that could make for a better memory. And in particular, I'm thinking of one called fluxonium. Uh, fluxonium is, uh, it, it's more of a, yeah, it's more in the lab, but it's a, it's an interesting type of qubit uh, where it's similar to the transmon, but it has a large inductance uh, in, in the middle by making lots and lots and lots of Joseph injunctions. Um, that one can have a very long lifetime. There's another one called the zero pi qubit, which is uh, which was pioneered by uh, a, actually a group at Princeton that I've collaborated with in the past. Um, it's called the zero pi qubit, so it's something we call a, a protected qubit, and that its kind of energy level structure is made such that it won't decohere. But these same kinds of things that make them decohere make them very difficult to operate on. Um, but you could foresee in the future maybe um, the transmon superconducting qubit used for the uh, computation and a different kind of superconducting qubit used as a memory, such as the zero pi. Okay, thank you so much for uh, for your time and your dedication and and the great presentation that you uh, that you gave us today. Uh, I think that uh, Professor Ahmed may um, may want to ask you something or say a few words to you. But at the end, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'd and like uh, to thank right you now, very, I very 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 much for being with us and. Uh, we are looking further uh, forward for more uh, meetings with you if you agree if you are okay, fine great. and uh, because we, we we would like to see you many times <laughs> <laughs> nice no thank you so much for the it was a pleasure to be here and yeah. i really thank you for your attention and all your great questions yeah, thank you very much thank you all right have a great evening yeah thank you you too you too bye bye so everyone uh Right now, we conclude our meeting. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording right now. Okay, I.